This is Cosmographia, the Randall Carlson Podcast. Gentlemen, this is Cosmographia, the Randall Carlson podcast, and we are joined by the usual suspects. We got Bradley, we have normal guy Mike, and, Mike, and we, of course we have myself and Kyle How's and going, Randall, everybody? Randall Carlson, and uh, I think we are continuing on with some of the most interesting uh, bits here about the firestorms. We ended last uh, la- the last show with some fascinating uh, personal accounts. Read, uh, that Randall read from some letters. And I think we're going to be continuing on in that vein, right, Randall? Well, yeah, I think there's a few more unanswered questions about the whole, that whole uh, yeah. sequence of events, uh, wouldn't you say? I think so. I don't think we've solved anything here, but I think we have raised some valuable questions in the process, but I don't think we've answered those questions. Do you think we can? Can we answer those? I don't know. Yeah. I honestly don't know. I think at, at least I, asking the right questions is a good place to start. It's exactly the point, Russ. It, mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Asking the right questions. It's still the X factor, though. And see, when you say asking the right questions, think about the word question, right? And think about the story of the grail now what is one of the great a themes quest. a quest yes a quest a yes. quest yun get it yes they uh, both yeah, I... a quest and a question and you know think of the moral of the story so percival stumbles upon the castle corbanic which housed the grail this is where the grail was kept first he had encountered the uh, the lame fisher king fishing in a river and then from there, he probably through some kind of special uh, guidance given to him by the Fisher King, he uh, serendipitously studied, uh, stumbled upon Castle Corbanic, went in and he was entertained in this great hall with a procession of these young people bearing uh, a, a strange objects. And he watched in fascination, but he refused to ask the critical question what it all meant. So he had this entire drama presented right before him, and he didn't ask the question of what was the meaning of what he was seeing because he was trying to be polite. And he had been told that, you know, you don't want to be too uh, outspoken and arrogant and and uh, you should always listen and just so he, he didn't ask the question. And because he didn't ask the question, the curse, the enchantment was not lifted. The curse was not broken. And so it had to go on for at least, it depends on which account you're reading, but at least another five years of, of impoverishment and misery of the wasteland. But he could have ended it right there and healed the king right there if he'd asked the right question. That's, that's the basis of the story. And so... The key to the successful completion of the quest, you see, is asking the right question at the right time. And now it seems like uh, there's a lot of forces aligned to prevent the asking of obvious questions, questions that beg to be asked about some of the things that are going on in the world and in our nation today, but we won't go down that road because that takes us directly into the realm of politics. So, so let's just, let's just think about a few of the things that we've learned over these past episodes. Uh, what was the first great fire that's now considered the greatest, uh, fire forest fire in at least Eastern Canadian history. It was the Miramichi. I think we got that pronunciation right. Didn't somebody from that area correct Miramichi. us? Miramichi. Yeah, I think so. That's good. Mir- yeah. Miramichi. 1825. 18, 1825. Yeah. What was the date on that? I think we found that there might be some significance to the date. 
That was October. Uh, October seventh. 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 And then, of course, we moved on to the Great Chicago Fire, and which was the greatest urban disaster for fire disaster in American history. And the Pashtigo Fire, which was the greatest in terms of uh, mortality anyway, the most deadly forest fire in American history. Um, and we found out that they occurred so essentially simultaneously on the same evening at about the same outbreak, hour of outbreak at about 9 p.m., maybe a little earlier, it's, it's hard to tell, but pretty much in that same window. And then we also learned that there was the Manistee Fire across the lake, across the Lake Michigan. It was actually greater in magnitude and consumed more acreage, but is less well known because of the fact that the, the mortality level was so much lower. Mostly because there wasn't apparent, there was apparently in that area mostly um, most of the human occupation was lumber camps rather than settled communities and villages like there was in the pathway of Peshtigo. So we had those two fires, and they occurred on what was the date? October, October 8th. 8th. Then we learned, let's see, we learned about the Hinkley fire, which had a lot of similarities in terms of the intensity, the speed, the ferocity, the anomalous uh, things associated with it made it very similar to the Pashtigo fire. But that was a completely different day. That was September. Right. So, so, but as far as the other fires, we learned that that particular date of 7th, 8th, and 9th seemed to be uh, a period that uh, these firestorms were very prevalent. So we then learned that something else occurred. Why? Because of the, the, the simultaneity of the outbreaks of these fires. Remember the descriptions now of um, almost as if there's uh, incendiary devices being set off simultaneously. That's how, how, how it was several of these fire outbreaks were described. Yeah, and that it seemed like hilltops would catch on fire first, and the fire would come down. The the you know, like the right the um, the tops of buildings were on fire first, and the repeated um, sense of the fire being up in the the heavens in itself the and yeah, in the, the air sky itself. Was on fire, yeah, right, and the fire was burning where there was no apparent combustible material. Yes, and that certain in certain places people seem to witness things being consumed almost seemingly instantly by fire mm -hmm. people would just vanish you know um also strange things where like the, the one i remember is the was it the wagon tongue was it that where the metal was completely destroyed and the wooden wood was not yeah. burned or something like that yeah, yeah 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 all kinds of anomalous things like that that's that remind you of like almost like a torch like a torch, the torch of the avenging angel, you mean? Yes, right. Exactly. That one. Yeah, that one. That, that torch, yeah. Yes. Well, I yeah. think we, we kind of were introduced to the avenging angel. We've, we've pulled up his visage on several occasions. That's right. That's how he was depicted by, uh, by some of our predecessors, our cultural predecessors. Yep. And what is that? What is that? Uh, deck you use called again the builders of edom mm. the builders of the edom yeah paul foster case's deck was just basically a variation on the rider weight and the mm. the earlier marseille decks uh and others but he put his own particular added his own little seasoning to it and he was yeah. quite a learned uh scholar of occultism, ancient traditions, things like that. So he added some stuff that um, you got to wonder. Hmm. In the Rider Waite, um, the booklet that comes with it, they talk about how a lot of the symbolism comes from ancient Egypt. Yes. Yes. That's right. Yeah. So there was lots of interesting hints in those symbols that may connect possibly back to the Grail stuff that you were just talking about. You know, oh, the very the, absolutely is. Yeah, and the seeds, the yud, mm -hmm. the ace of cups. Yeah, 
That's it right there. That is a depiction of the whole concept of the grail right there, the Ace of Cups. And we've looked at that. And boy, yeah. there's a lot more to talk about there. And that's interesting stuff. But so, we'll, that brings so are us. We, are, we zo are we zeroing in on the right questions with yeah. all of this stuff? Okay. But I will just say this, that when we start getting into that, that analysis of the Ace of Cups, that takes us straight into the realm of exobiology. Mm. So might be good to have our ducks in a row before we tackle that subject. <laughs> our cosmic ducks need to our be Our cosmic, row. that's what I'd say. Yeah. Our inter <laughs> intergalactic ducks. <laughs> Make sure that Chandra is ready for a guest appearance. Yeah, we'll, we'll get Chandra, Dr. Dr. Wick Ramasinghe on. Yeah. Well, okay then. So, um, good. Yeah. We, these are some of the key things, uh, that we learned about these fires. Um, and of course I'm assuming that folks are listening to this episode. They've already listened to the previous ones, so we don't have to do too much of a recap. Right. But, um, it's good just even for us to kind of refresh our mind on some of the details, because remember the devil's in the details. And this could be, um, speaking of the devil, I mean, maybe we are in fact looking at the, uh, the handiwork of the devil here. Yeah. Yeah. Do you, do you think so? Well, a, ser a serpent or a dragon, a hey. serpent or a hey, dragon. Man. Yes. Serpents yes. are the good guys. Serpents are the good guys, but you know, Hey, that's <laughs> the thing. The serpents can be the bad guys too. Yeah. They can. Yeah. yeah. Um, just like uh, Hathor can turn into Sekhmet, which we're going right. to come back to in a second here. Um, but yeah, let's, uh, since you said that and mentioned serpents, and I think maybe we'll just, uh, take well, a look we here. Remind of what's going on exogenically, right? During those dates. Yeah, please do. Wasn't well, that where you're going? You're well, doing it, Brad. Well, the serpent and right. the dragon uh, leads leads to constellation Draco and the draconid meteor shower, and the draconid meteor. Yes, that exactly was, on those dates. That was exactly on those dates. Yes, and we saw some very compelling symbolism there, didn't we? So there's the Mexican Codex Quetzalcoatl, the plumed Atoll. serpent. Quattle, thank you. Now notice, well, I've always just, noticed that ATL. Atoll. That's Atoll. what I was yeah. just pointing out. Atoll. Yeah. Yes. Atoll. 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 Yeah, Quattle. The plumed serpent is shown devouring a man. Hmm. All right, so there we've got is that St. George. St. George. All right. So what's he doing? You notice? Okay, he's got this long lance. He's she's got the dragon on a leash. Yeah. Mm. Interesting. And he is appears to be stabbing the dragon in the eye with a long lance. Well, I thought it was right in the nostril. Interesting. Maybe it's in the nostril. Painful either way. Right. Yeah. I, I think that yeah, I would think that that's the nostril. I don't know if this is on topic. It seems connected to me, but I remember when I was looking into um, the variations on the story of the Tower of Babel, um, there was one where they basically the gods had claimed the heavens for themselves mm -hmm. and man was not allowed up there, but that man would occasionally see, you know, a God flying in the sky. And one, eventually one guy picked up a lance and threw it at the God flying in the sky and hit it and blood fell. Mm -hmm. And then the people knew that they could be killed. And that was when they began to build the tower. So have you ever heard that rendition? No, I haven't. So, but, but it's, yeah, I think that sounds uh, very um, compelling. I think if you yeah. can save that, because yeah, in fact, we're going to be when we get into some of the Grail stuff, we'll be talking about you know blood from the sky, blood from the sky, red right. rain falling from the sky, 
yeah. Saturn's yep. Saturn's blood comes down and yeah. Yep. The, yep. Stuff that's the fallen Earth from born. the sky that actually has been tested that appears to be blood. Yes, that's right. Yes. What the hell is going on there? <laughs> well, I got some thoughts. We'll, we'll, yeah, we definitely can bring in some of that stuff. But Excellent. in effect, what we're looking at right here actually um, may have us some clues. Look at this. Sigmund, Siegfried displaying Fafner. Get it? Can you see the coiled dragon yes, serpent here? Yep. Here's Siegfried's sword. Yeah. He's doing battle with Fafner. And he's in the Hercules pose. Sure. He sure is. That's oh, true. He is, he is. Yeah, he's in the Hercules. Look at that. Yep. Wow. And look, look like, like, look at his, his leg here. Yeah. And definitely got the Hercules lunge going on. Yeah, look at this. And, oh, uh, hmm. So, Swashman Walkman, I know we weren't supposed to bring that up, but <laughs> it's uh, a, Her a Hercules. What do you, a Hercule, Hercule, yeah, the Herculeids. Tau, tau Herculeids or something. Herculeids. Yeah. All right. Yeah, so I was, I was biting my from, tongue, but yeah. Whoops. Yeah. Tau Herculeids. Tau Herculeids. Another depiction of Siegfried doing battle with the great dragon serpent Fafner in a painting mm. by Conrad Delitz. These are good. Yeah. Now, this is some great stuff. That is cool. Oh, man. Look at that one. A substantial beast. Yeah, a substantial yes. beast indeed. <laughs> it is. That is a that is a great water serpent right there. So in this but, case, the thing from heaven is actually striking the beast on earth. That's a little different. Yeah. Or, or yeah. That's interesting. So a, a heavenly being of tremendous power here is holding his sword, wielding his sword, and it appears as if as if the dragon is perhaps writhing and yes. Yeah, it's already been stabbed, probably. Yeah. It's uh -huh. been slain. Yeah. And look at the water that it's churning up and yeah, like causing, it's causing this massive some tsunamis. <laughs> That's cool. Yeah. Yeah, really. Yeah. Causing tsunamis. Wow. Oh. Another codex. That's the from the Dresden Codex. And here is look at this. I, I think this is completely a mind blowing connection right here because here's the dragon serpent, the, the dragon sky serpent. Uh, belching out the waters of the water, great flood. The water, yeah, yeah. of the yep. flood. What? While the god of death waits on the sideline here. Pretty wild stuff. Now look at this. This this one really blows my mind. Check okay, this. I see the yeah, I see the, the lion and the definitely something flying through the sky in the background oh, there. For sure. Oh yeah, I mean the, he's the sun setting the and a star flying band. to the sky. Yeah, is that the sun setting or the moon rising? It could be the moon yeah. rising. Yeah, hmm. but that right above it is absolutely no doubt that's a comet, right? And he's telling us, uh, see, this is the myth of Phaeton by Gustav, yeah. Gustav Moreau, and this is Phaeton. That's Phaeton falling to Earth. And he's telling us the timing of it. I mean, uh, there's the blank man of the ecliptic. So the, sun, the sun is in Leo there? You see, if you look at the bottom of the painting, underneath the uh, uh, bull's head or dragon's head, no, I'm sorry, that's beneath the horse. Mm -hmm. Right below to the right of the moon, there's rays from a setting sun. Hmm. I would think that the oh, sun... So then, actually, that's... that's uh, Probably with a moon behind a cloud. Yeah, that's yeah. what it was looking. And like, then the yeah. horizon is actually this. Yeah, hmm. I can see that now. Yeah, I see the serpent. So it's you got Phaeton in the the chariot. The horses are going crazy. Mm -hmm. The lions up there to tell you, give you a hint about the time of time of year or yeah, or the or the, or the, the age, year. the zodiacal the age. age of Leo. Right. Right. I'm thinking it, it could be the zodiacal age of Leo. Yeah. 
Wow. And then the dragon rising up from the earth. Mm -hmm. Wonder how big that is. That's probably amazing to see in person. I bet it would be. Yep. That's St. Michael, I believe, on this one, not St. George. Once again, don't notice the spear, the lance that's always being wielded by the yeah. by the hero. And then oh, up a, here. Sorry, go ahead. Well, I was going to call attention to this lady back here. Is he defending the lady from the dragon? She doesn't seem to be concerned. She's just <laughs> she watching the sunset. <laughs> doesn't have a leash on it this time either. Right. Doesn't have a leash on it this time either. And that thing's more like a wyvern. A wyvern. Yeah, yeah. a wyvern. Yeah. To explain what a wyvern. Bird, it's got, well, it's part, it's like a dragon, but it's got kind of a bird yeah. front. Yeah. Uh-huh. Well, so here the next one. It's very explicit about the association of the serpent with a meteor. And here's another one from oh. Theatrica, Theatrum Cometicum, that's 1667, a traditional European depiction of a comet as a cosmic serpent. A meteor as a descending dragon. So when when you get into the mythology of serpents and dragons, well, you have the you know you have the winged serpents, the plumed serpents, but you have dragons which are can be creatures of the sky or creatures of the earth. Yeah, and I think that's a very significant uh, character trait that is the clue to what we're really looking at here. Uh, but that's uh, that takes us I, into I, the realm of beyond tonight's discussion. Okay. Well, can I? Of course. Can I suggest something about sure. possibility. Yeah. I mean, it just makes me think of like the, you know, like volcanism is the other is the earthly dragon, perhaps. Perhaps. So, well, we'll we'll explore that. We'll okay. explore the um, the earth dragon myths and the serpent myths. And I think what it leads us to is right into the realm of telluric energy. Okay, cool. And geomancy. Or, That's way cooler than volcanoes. Well, are they're, they're probably connected. In fact, we can say they're certainly connected. Yeah, you're right. Though. It is interesting because when the dragon's in the sky, it's, depict, it's flying, it may be breathing fire. When it's in the earth, it's sleeping on a pile of jewels and gold, like wealth or treasure, you know, like mm -hmm. in the standard story. So, but it can be woken and it can rise up from the oh, earth. Yeah. That's if right. you wake it up, you got a big problem and breathe yeah. fire. That's mm -hmm. right. So, if we're trying to portray this in some kind, of, some kind of a scientific scenario, and we're and we're hypothesizing that the Cosmic dragon is, in fact, meteors, fireballs, asteroids, comets, things in the heavens that could affect life on Earth and probably have been witnessed and experienced by ancestors um, of doing just that. So, but then what do we, how do we envision there might be a real world, um, can we say, connection with the earth serpent, the earth dragon under the earth. And I think what that comes down to is possibly, and it, and this would link with volcanism because you know, the crust is fractured. There are fault lines, there are fractures within the earth's crust. And there's also various kinds of ores and minerals within the earth's crust. There's movements of the earth's crust. Sometimes you'll have contiguous sections of the earth's crust moving it, uh, relative to each other, that would be what defines a fault line in most cases. And this can generate changes in the electromagnetic field. Now, a lot of those fractures and fault lines that we're talking about in the crust of the earth 
there's a whole school of thought that most of those fractures and fault lines are the consequence of cosmic hypervelocity impacts throughout the history of the Earth. Yeah, okay. Which makes sense. Yeah, when and I was, also, I was also going to say that the connection with the dragon in the Earth sleeping with the treasure is like, you know, at the center of impacts is where you find lots of very rare metals. That's right. That's right. So. You know, if you, yeah, think of uh, Sudbury up in Canada. Think of the Vrita Fort structure in South Africa. There's many yeah. examples where astrobeams are the sources of platinum precious metals, metals, platinum yeah. rubies. Yes, right. And now we know that they make trillions of tiny diamonds, so they have jewels as well. You yes, know, it's like yeah. strange how all this can connect back to these very ancient stories. Yes. So was that is that Latin there? Did you translate that? What does it what does it say on there? Oh, um I did it, it one point. It says we're all going to die. In in Kala, Arden, <laughs> in, come in Congo, fire. Attracta. That's the uh precursor to the electric universe model, just <laughs> in Latin. Kyle. This is this is not the appropriate time for levity. <laughs> I am inappropriate for this podcast. Have you ever <laughs> so what is the opposite of levity? Gravity. Um, right? Gravity. Oh, okay, yes. Yeah. Okay, yes. yeah. I can see Duh. that. That's right. Gravity and levity. Gravi gravitas. <laughs> so, <laughs> oh, well, I was about to go off on a tangent. A very interesting tangent, but I kind of told myself I wasn't going to go off on tangents. But I'll just mention who... Well, just uh, can't uh, not one thing, it. one thing. Okay. So my point being <laughs> in the interests of levity, who was, uh, given the task of transporting the Ark of the covenant from one place to another by means of staves passed uh, through the rings of the Levites. Mm -hmm. David, there we go. Yeah. The Levites. The Levit, the Levi, yeah, yes, of course, I get it. So mull that over, mm -hmm. and in the next episode, we might circle back to that. All right, I'll think about that. Yeah. If you think of the levity being the opposite of gravity, yeah, and then if you remember that because the ark was composed of so much gold, it was extremely heavy. It was. It was. Yes. But anyways, we'll leave it at that. We'll okay. continue on here. Where's um, my Indiana Jones theme? Where are the tangent yeah, tees? Yeah, that. Just to show another interesting correlation between the serpent and cosmic impact, we have exhibit A right here. Serpent mound. Right? Now, wait a minute. We're going on a trip, or who's going? What, what's this? You guys were talking about serpent well, mound been, earlier. Yes, we've been discussing. We've been maybe, dying to go there. Yeah, we've been discussing possibly getting over there after the Montana trip is over for and the solstice. Brad just crushed my dreams and yes. said that we probably won't be able to make it in time for the solstice. Maybe That's we right. can make it for the solstice sunset, mm. but not the sunrise. Yeah, our, our tour is down the nineteenth, yeah. and solstice is twenty first. So yeah, we'd have to cut out pretty fast and. Buzz two thousand miles over there, but yeah. Paul, uh, yeah, I'm man, not saying it can't be done. Two thousand miles with a baby is I don't know, Brad. Yeah, it's not. Mm. Hey, and if you were if you were flying along, I mean, you'd have to be you know keeping the pedal to the metal at at least ninety miles per hour on say on average, right? On average, and you get pulled yeah. over, you tell them you've got to get to Serpent Mound, Winter right. Solstice so, Sunset, yeah. aligned with the uh, Serpent's head. You're you've got to get there. That's right. Could you? They they should let us go, right? Good late. Yeah, you need yeah. to let us go. The cops. Oh, I'm sorry. Just sorry. Just keep going. going. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, move along. Sure. <laughs> but I love this. I love this mound. I love this. Uh, I've. I've. I don't know. I've read about a lot of about it, and I have been dying to get up there to see it. It's worth seeing, and and you know what's great is that in this area, there's so many. It's one of the thickest, densest clusters of. Monumental earthworks still existing in this area of Ohio. Gotta so go. you know you can you can include this in a uh, a multi uh, site uh, tour. Yeah, and we should do that. Yeah, we should actually. We, for sure. we should please let's. I let's think this would that. be an awesomely awesome tour. And and because there's it's, so much astronomy and Earth, you know, I mean, 
yeah, the whole, yeah. Well, let's, uh, it's, I just love it. It's a beautiful representation mm -hmm. of the, you know, the idea of this, like a comet or an impact or yeah, something. The serpent carrying the cosmic egg. And, you know, it's got the spiral at the end. Like you can imagine, you yeah. know, the object is out there making orbiting its and orbits orbiting and over orbiting. and over. And then eventually it gets pulled in by a planet and it goes through this little zigzag motion as it's yep. being pulled into the inner solar system. And then it's like the thing is positioned right on the edge of an astro beam. It's just so like, I mean, this is, yeah, it's, I, this it's, blows my mind. I, yeah. I'm, I'm really excited to get there. I hope we can do it. And, and then you, when you look at the egg in its mouth, Yes. Here, it's if, if a that's seed what it, or an egg, yes, yes, an egg. Does it, doesn't it strike anybody that this is a whole looks a, a whole lot like a spermatozoa? It well, does, I yeah. I thought of that, Mike. I wasn't going to bring that up. Yeah, we weren't going to talk <laughs> but, about that. But well, no, normal guy doing his job. <laughs> okay, but Mike brings up something really interesting, though. Yes, all all levity aside. Um, he does, he brings up something very interesting and that's something that we will be touching back on as we get into some of the mysteries of the grail and so on. And well, so back forth. to the exobiology you brought up earlier, back to the exobiology we brought up earlier. Exactly. That's exactly it. So you mentioned Kyle, that it's right on the edge of an astro bloom. Let's look at this here. Let's see. Here we yeah. go. I love this picture. Gosh, look at that. Yeah. I love this picture. It's also on a peninsula between two uh, converging streams. Yes. It is in a perfect position. Like a diamond head. And yeah. you can actually see the mouths of these openings into the, that are almost, you know. Nostrils. Nostrils, yeah. Oh, man, yeah. And you can see, look here, you see the, the triangular shape of the viper's head? Yeah. Right here? So it's and, a natural formation that they were like, yes, this is a serpent. Mm-hmm. And a, you can That's... see it winding around back this way. The tail's out here. And then over here is the basin of the ancient impact structure. So how about that? So cool. So cool. So see, here's the thing. This whole landscape is probably honeycombed with, um, with caves and apertures and uh, capillaries mm. through here. The water can move through the earth here as well as on the surface. Mm. There we go. The Serpent Mound area is renowned for a large geological disturbance. Remnants of perhaps the most cataclysmic event ever to occur in Ohio. Serpent Mound sits on the outer edge of the disturbed area. I like that. The disturbed area which measures 3.5 to 4 miles in diameter and covers between 12 and 15 square miles. Within the central part of the area, rocks have been thrust upward at least 1,000 feet above their original positions. Yes. How cool is that? So, see, you know, you got to know I mean, things like this when we're visiting, see? I can't help but, but think that the people who, you know, engineered, designed, built this thing, that were um, at least being guided by science. You know, they, they, they had to know something, you know what I mean? Like this is, apparently that yeah. astro bleam is extremely Feel old. something. Yeah. So L it, li listen to the rest of this, this um, uh, explanation of it, uh, description of it. Surrounding this area. Now this is the area that is the, um, it says that there's this, uh, Disturbed area measures, say, four miles in diameter. And within the central part of that area, the rocks have been thrust upward a thousand feet. Then surrounding this area is a lower area where the rocks are approximately at their normal elevations. A ring grobbin. What's a ring grobbin? This is where rocks have been down dropped. It forms the outer portion of the structure. Here, the ground surface is higher in elevation, but the bedrock has been dropped down as much as 400 feet from its original position. So you've got in the middle of this wow. thing, you've got rocks that have been thrust upward a thousand feet, surrounded by rocks that have been thrust downward by 400 feet for a total differential of 1400 feet. And this differentiation in the what had previously been uniform and uh, um, level strata 
happened within a matter of seconds, of course. That's the thing to keep in mind. This isn't the process. This isn't the result of some long, drawn-out process that took years and years, thousands of years. This, no, this happened in an instant. So then, goes on to say, intermixed within and between these regions are numerous faults, synclines, and anticlines. Remember what synclines and anticlines are? A syncline is yes. a down warping and an anticline is an up warping. Right. And when we were in the scab lands, we, you know, there were many examples of anticlines there. Remember the, right. the, um, the Cooley monocline? A yeah. monocline is, in, is simply one side. One side. Yep. So, uh, so re- numerous faults, synclines, and anticlines, places where massive cracks formed within the rock. And they are buckled into upward or downward arches. In some locations, the rock layers have been turned on edge and on other layers have been turned upside down. The destructive event that formed the structure may have taken place more than 200 million years ago during the late Triassic. But my point about what's happened to the bedrock there, see that, that, fracturing of the bedrock now allows for the movement of fluids of all kinds. It could be water. It mm. could be fluid basaltic magma. And hence the connection with, with uh, volcanic eruptions when you were mentioning volcanism earlier, Kyle, um, because there may be a connection between the location of volcanoes, volcanic activity, and impacts. That's not... Uh, I, I can imagine, yeah. Yeah. So then, how many of you remember this? The Portsmouth Works, the giant serpentine effigy that's basically no longer there. And it consisted of a series of concentric rings. Then it crossed the Ohio River, came up here, and then there was this kind of scattering of mounds, structures, uh, circular dome structures, arch structures. These, of course, are all gone now because the city of Portsmouth is here. But then you can see what appears to almost be kind of a serpent's head coming back, and then it crosses the river again, and then there's another earth mound here, of which the remnant is still there. Brad and I have visited that. We visited this. Um, this is a remnant over here. That's all that's left. The ring structure is mostly... No, wait a minute. That No, no, that was Newark where the golf course was. Yeah, that was Newark. Um but yeah, this was once part of a structure that was in total length, 10 miles long. Incredible. It's yeah. it. Yeah, it's totally incredible. So somebody somebody went to a lot of effort to, to do all of this. So there are some stories uh, from Native Americans that inhabited this area, and I'll have to dig up the sources of this, that, they're, that they interpreted the Ohio River as being a uh, a terrestrial counterpart to the Milky Way galaxy in much the same way that the Egyptians yeah. looked at the Nile River. Which, if that Isn't was the that case, interesting. this is kind of an interesting thing then because you've got this arc that comes across and intersects twice. So if this, let's assume just for the sake of uh, an interesting metaphor that this stood in for the Milky Way galaxy, well... Then what is this? Is this the plane of the ecliptic, the ecliptic which crosses, yeah. crosses the um, the Milky Way galaxy twice? I don't know. Or the yeah, or the tail of a, a path of a comet, or the path of a comet. <sighs> we got to do these mounds. Got to see this stuff. Yeah, we need to do a a tour of the mound structures yeah that's Caravans. that would be a good one and that that could be kind of an affordable one as well maybe well depends. we got to do some planning we could maybe look at this fall i like this the flag of wales and the origins of the red dragon on the flag of wales are kind of controversial and mysterious but how interesting whales think about whales what what are, you know the things we associate with whales the quest arthur uh all of that the whole the welsh stories 
So the here's uh, this is from um, the Morian Institute, uh, the European Dark Age and the Welsh Oral Tradition on the Trail of the Dragon. The mystery of the origins of the red dragon symbol now on the flag of Wales has perplexed many historians, writers, and romanticists, and the archaeological community generally has refrained from commenting on this most unusual emblem, claiming it does not concern them. In the ancient Welsh language, it is known as, and I'm not going to attempt to um, yeah, pronounce don't, that. Don't even try. <laughs> it's, it's Drag gosh. Drag gosh, which means red dragon. And then um, the University of Wales Welsh Dictionary, there are translations from the various uses of the Welsh word drag. Amongst them are common uses of the word, which is today taken just to mean a dragon. But in times past, it has also been used to refer to Met distal, which is probably not even close to what it's pronounced, but was usually taken to mean sheet lightning. Um, now we get this. Okay. The most interesting common usage of the word in earlier times, according to this authoritative dictionary, is main melet, melet, melt. I don't know. But the word used to refer to a meteorite. And this makes sense as the Welsh word main translates as stone, while the Welsh word whatever translates as lightning. So literally a lightning stone. Understones, wow. The ancient language of the Welsh Druids has words still in use today that have in the past been used to describe both a dragon and also a meteorite is something that greatly helps us to follow the destructive trail of the dragon as it was described in early Welsh riddle poems. Um, Ooh, riddle poems sound cool. I like that too, riddle poems. So the lyrics of your songs, think of them that way, Kyle, that they're riddle poems. Yeah. Then your your music takes a whole nother layer of meaning. So in recent years, certain astronomers have come increasingly to appreciate that encoded in the folklore and mythologies of many cultures, excuse me, are the accurate observations of ancient sky watchers. This is a good thing. Um so yes, talking about celestial battles, um, variously depicted as the gods and curiously the imagery in these myths have many common features even between cultures and um oh yeah the tales of Lelochen. but we're going to save this for for the next time because i want to circle back i think we've made a very interesting foray into the connection between cosmic phenomena some kind of a terrestrial counterpart and the association of serpents and dragons with both phenomena. And therein, I think we have an opening into understanding what I think is probably one of the most powerful metaphysical uh, systems of symbology that have come down to us, which is the corpus of grail material from the Middle Ages. I think that's awesome. That's that's great. Yeah. And I think this stuff Fantastic. that we've come up with so far really is going to be sort of a, one of the keys that will unlock that doorway into the mysteries of the grail is understanding these connections. Excellent. Yeah. So let's well, go this, back this, to Well, this is a this is a good place to break, Randall, Okay. if you All right. If you think and we can All right, let's a short break, come back for the second half of the show. Yeah. This is excellent. And uh food yeah. for thought. Definitely food for thought. We'll be right back. And welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to Cosmographia. Still um, digging into the Ekperusis. Is that proper pronunciation i think it's close enough 
All right. And I, I'm really loving the discussion about these, you know, the mounds, the all the serpent uh, yes, mythology. That is some rich stuff there for it sure. Is rich stuff. Yeah. Uh, before we go back into it, though, folks, of course, we want to mention our uh, good friends over at CBD from the gods dot com. Uh, you can go there to their website if you're interested in checking out any of their products, CBD oil, DAV, and other products that are good for the mind and the soul, apparently. And the right, body. Randall? And the body. And body. Yeah, That's and right. I, I'm, I will have my, I've got my bottle set aside already in my suitcase when, uh, for the Montana tour coming up in a few weeks so that when I'm in strange places and strange beds and strange environments, it will help me get that restful sleep that I need. Uh, to really enjoy these journeys across these amazing lands. So, yep, I wouldn't think now of going on a trip without it. That's great. RC ships free is the promo code. When you uh, purchase something, it'll you'll give you free shipping. So thanks to CBDFromTheGods.com. Okay. So, yeah, just uh, make sure everybody knows there may be a few spots left in the Montana trip. It'll be coming soon. You might be a last minute substitute, but uh, yeah, get yourself on the, on the list just in case. And if not, you'll be uh, first in line for the trip next September. Yeah, we're going to be visiting some pretty awesome places and uh, putting together some major, uh, major pieces of this amazing story of the terminal ice age floods the mega floods. So we'll be venturing into the basin of Lake Missoula. Yes. And it's going to be a, you know, a first time tour for, for the team here. Mm -hmm. I know Randall and Brad have been there many times, but, uh, for putting on the tour, it'll be a first time. It's always a great adventure doing the first time. We, we kind of work out the kinks and we really appreciate people coming along and, um, discovering all of the, uh, you know, aspects of the yep. first tour with us. That's right. Yeah, and helps help. us learn and helps us get better. And you can, while you're there, you can, incidentally, you can help us work out the kinks. That's it. That's right. Yeah, exactly. That's right. <laughs> so, we have a lot of, re we have a lot of return customers to the Scablands. So, you know, yeah, it was, it's always great fun. Yeah. I think, yeah, I'm really looking forward to it. Our, our sojourn on Flathead Lake is going to be great. Oh man. Oh, man. Oh, yeah. for that. And this one's almost a whole week, so you have an extra day and a half. Uh, the The next ones are going to be shorter, so you really get to dig in and see a lot of the territory with us if you go June 13th and 19th. And if we're lucky, maybe we'll see the monster that lives in Flathead Lake. That's what I'm looking forward to. Me too. Yeah. yeah. Lippy. We need to have a discussion. We're going to have a drawing, and we're going to, there's going to be a drawing, and whoever's name we draw, they get thrown in in the to, middle to, of the lake that's and right to find the monster we, we yeah. leave him there for an hour and see what happens <laughs> well a, we a but you failed to mention we will provide flotation device <laughs> right so one floaty we'll give you a right they're gonna be a bobber right <laughs> <laughs> it's so okay this randall's is, name's also going to be in the hat so <laughs> it could be randall it could be <laughs> oh really <laughs> yeah. Well, that was in the fine print. I remember that's right. right. Yes. You uh, signed it. You signed it, Randall. Okay, so let's uh, let's jump back for a second to the Great Chicago Fire. And uh, Mike, I'll ask you this question. So you haven't said much. Who is often uh, blamed for starting the Great Chicago Fire, Mike? This is O'Leary's cow. I knew Mike would have that right. information at his. Yeah. Mrs. O'Leary. Yes. Mrs. O'Leary's cow. So, um, yeah, let me, um, where am I here? Okay. Let's see. Mrs. O'Leary's cow. So, uh, I think I have a picture here of Mrs. O'Leary's cow. Let's see if this is going to work. I'll do a share screen and. We shall see if I can make this work. Did okay. Mrs. O'Leary's cow die? Did you know Brian Wilson wrote a song about Mrs. O'Leary's cow? Mrs. O'Leary's cow is immortal, Brad. Well, I was thinking of the song. It reminded me of the, of the song by Moody Blues, Timothy Leary. 
Yeah. <laughs> I caught the uh, melody you were singing. It, I, and see, I knew that the only one uh, of us here would, that would pick that up would be you, Mike. So that was for you, actually. That was special for you. Um, let's see. I'm trying to get into... Uh, sorry. Here we go. Here we go. This is interesting. <laughs> O'Leary, the surname is an anglicized form of the old Gaelic word oleong, oleonger, which translates literally as keeper of the calves. Keeper of the calves. Hmm. Okay. Okay. What are you guys seeing? We see uh, the... Kicking the, cow. The work screen, not the presentation. Okay. Cow said, don't touch me there. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Are you seeing the presentation view now? There it is. Yes. There it is. Yeah. Well, there we see. There's there's the uh, the folklore. Mrs. O'Leary and her cow, and the cow is kicking over the lantern, and this is what started the fire. But I kind of find Mrs. O'Leary. Oops, Mrs. O'Leary's cow. Jumping ahead here, Mrs. O'Leary's cow to be a, perhaps a useful metaphor. So who was the cow in ancient Egypt? A. Well, we'll just jump jump back here. Hathor was the Hathor. cow goddess. Seems to have been popular at all periods of ancient Egyptian history. A cow goddess appears in the Narmer palette, which dates from about 1300, 3100 BC. That's a long time ago. Hathor was often represented entirely as a cow. In the Egyptian Museum in Cairo, there's a famous statue of her in this form. Hathor was otherwise depicted as a beautiful, slender woman wearing a headdress of a pair of cow's horns with a sun disc between them, or in human form with cow's ears. Very That's cagey. How- she was represented as a woman with the entire head of a cow. She thus represents divine motherhood. Yeah, on it at uh, Dendera, I think most of the depictions of her face there were with the, the cow's ears. Right. And the meaning of that name, Hathor, is House of Horus. House of what? Horus. Horus, yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Should have enunciated that a little bit better. So there is a representation of Hathor, the cow goddess. What I find particularly intriguing about that is her headdress. Does it appear yeah. to be sort of a red globular thing? Looks almost like, like some yep, it's got a tail. Yeah. Oops, plumes emanating out here. Yeah. And and shockwave. Uh-huh. Right. Uh-huh. Yeah. So hmm. Hathor was honored at with a shrine at Philae, the main sanctuary of Isis, just as Isis was worshipped at Hathor's cult center, Dendera. In later Egyptian history, the two deities were often regarded as one because they were both principally mother goddesses. From the New Kingdom, both were depicted wearing the same headdress, a pair of cow's horns with a sun disc between them. Here's the Temple of Isis at Philae. And... uh, There's the Temple of Hathor at Dendera. And we're definitely going to be coming back to a discussion of this particular... Look, you can see the cow goddess right here on the pillars with the duck with the cow's ears. Yeah. So I've read... So all of those faces are completely... Almost completely destroyed. Yeah. Uh, All four of them on the capitals there. They... You know, there's... There's ones facing each side and then there's a lot of them on the inside too and they're all... There's... I think there's one left somewhere in a back corner where that it hasn't been totally destroyed. Mm-hmm. But I read somewhere that uh, that because she can be a goddess of destruction, that the idea is that maybe Egypt went through some kind of, you know, catastrophic purge. or purge or catastrophic uh-huh, event, uh-huh. and they were angry at her, at the goddess Hathor for the destruction, and they defiled the temple. Now, does is there any connection with the um, the bull of heaven? From the Epic of Gilgamesh to um, is this? I could perhaps 
think that there might be a connection. Um, you know, from the, the, the work I was just reading, which was published in 2002, Ancient Egypt by Lorna Oaks and Lucia Gallen. Gallen um, I got another quote from it in, in, uh, with reference to what you just said, Kyle. Or what you were just asking about. Usually, because yeah, it's like, go ahead. Oh, well, usually Hathor was a benign goddess. However, in the myth, the destruction of humankind, she was sent by her father, the sun god Ra, or Ra, to punish the Egyptians for their disloyal murmurings against him. She changed from her maternal cow like self and became the raging lioness Sekhmet. Sekhmet. Yeah. Sekhmet, yeah. So, so from the bull to the lion. So mm -hmm. there, there, there she is there. Bow relief. Ah, Sek. Ah, darn it. Um, yeah, there, the bow relief of Sekhmet. There it is, right here, the lion-headed goddess. Here is a statue of Sekhmet, the fierce lion-headed goddess. So in from the book uh, by M. Lichtheim, Ancient Egyptian Literature, Volume 2, The New Kingdom, the function of Sekhmet slash Hathor as an agent of Ra is made manifest in the destruction of mankind myth found on the five royal New Kingdom tombs. Um, and is itself part of a larger work known as the Book of the Cow of Heaven. According to this story, Ra plans the destruction of rebellious mankind, and the Council of the Gods advises him, let your eye go and smite them for you, these schemers of evil. May it go down as Hathor. Let your eye go and smite them. May it go down as Hathor. I find that to be interesting words. Um, the eye. And then. Yeah, that's a little bit comet-like too. Yeah, the headdress. Well, the eye as well, because yeah. it's got the tail and yeah. it's got the. Um, the, the What's yes. the other? The, right. Whoops. The tail. I can't remember the name of the other part, you know, because the comet has two. Uh, It'll have multiple plumes sometimes. Yeah. Hmm. One of them is like the fragmented tail, I guess, and then the other one is actually the outgassing that's being pushed away from the sun. Is that what it is? Yeah, the tail is the gas that's actually okay. yeah. being. It, it's going to point away from the away sun from because the sun. It, it's being carried by the solar wind. The trail. The trail is the physical yes. matter discharging from yeah. a disintegrating nucleus. Yeah. What I want to do now is go to what I think of as perhaps a kind of a modern replay, right? How many of you guys remember the fires of fall of 2017? I do remember there were some big ones out there. Santa Rosa fire. Yeah. Yeah. Let's, let's, let's take a little more uh, detailed look at some of those fires and see okay. if there's any. So, um, here's from, uh, WPRI.com eyewitness news. This fall of 2017, uh, the title of the, uh, news report is wildfires ravage northern california with shocking speed santa rosa california over the ap wire an onslaught of wildfires across a wide swath of northern california broke out almost simultaneously mm. then grew exponentially swallowing up properties from wineries to trailer parks and tearing through both tiny rural towns and urban subdivisions. Um, from the uh, 
businessinsider.com article, why were the Napa Sonoma fires so bad? A series, a series, quote, a series of fires sparked in the Napa Valley grew as powerful winds pulled the flames across fields and freeways. More than 5,700 homes and other structures have been destroyed, and an estimated 90,000 people have been evacuated. At least 40 people are dead. The cause of the fires remained under investigation on Monday morning. Flames began to devour swaths of the Northern California wine country after most people went to bed. The fires were so intense that descriptions of them are apocalyptic. According to a New York Times dispatch from a neighborhood in Santa Rosa, California, the fire burned virtually everything it touched. Evidence of the fire's intensity was everywhere in Coffee Park, which residents described as an apocalyptic scene. The aluminum wheels on cars melted and dripped down driveways like tiny rivers of mercury before hardening. A pile of bottles melded together into a tangle so contorted it looked like a Picasso. Plastic garbage bins were reduced to mere stains on the pavement. The, the inferno swept up over a wooded ridge, like many California wildfires do, but this one was different. Like a terror in the night, this wall of wind-whipped flames took direct aim for the heart of a city, not just the rural outskirts, not just the homes high in the hills or off the grid. The Tubbs Fire one of 14 wildfires that scarred the people and property of eight Northern California counties late Sunday and early Monday. Incinerated dozens of city blocks in Santa Rosa, destroying so many of the trappings of suburban life from the Hilton Sonoma wine country and Fountain Grove Inn to Technology Park from Applebee's and Arby's to Kmart and Kohl's. At least 15 people have died in Northern, these are different news reports, at least 15 people have died in Northern California after what officials are describing as an unprecedented wildfire that has already destroyed 2,000 structures and devastated large swaths of wine country. Here's a quote from Amy Head, the fire captain spokeswoman for Cal Fire, the state agency responsible for fire protection. This is what she told The Guardian. We often have multiple fires going on, but the majority of them, of these fires, all started right around the same time period, the same time of night. It's unprecedented. Maybe it's, no, not it's not. Maybe it's not unprecedented. She says, I hate using the word because it's been overused a lot lately because of how fires have been in the past few years. But it truly is. There has been a lot of destruction. Marion Williams, who caravaned with neighbors through flames before dawn, as one of the wildfires reached the vineyards and ridges of her small Sonoma County town of Kenwood, quoting, it was an inferno like you've never seen before. Williams could feel the heat of her fire through the car as she fled. Trees, quote, were on fire like torches. Another witness, Mike Wilmarth, a Napa middle school teacher who has lived in the area for 30 years, We've never had a fire like this before. We've never had devastation like this. Going on. With roads still blocked by the police and fires still raging across broad, broad swaths of Northern California, Matt Lenzi, Lenzi hiked through smoke-choked vineyards and waded the Napa River to reach the home his father lived in for 
53 years. In its place, he found only blackened debris, blackened earth, and ash. Every piece of vegetation was gone, said Mr. Lindsay. More than 20,000 people have needed evacuation warnings, fleeing on foot and by car as the fires overtook their towns. Local governments issued new evacuation orders early Wednesday, and many of them have spent nights in dozens of evacuation centers set up around the region. Survivors told of narrow escapes from walls of flame that seemed to erupt from nowhere on Sunday night and Monday morning, forcing them to run even before text messages and other alerts were sent out by emergency warning systems. No one could have predicted that reports of wildfires in the North Bay would lead to such widespread devastation, homes, businesses, livelihood gone. The fires broke out nearly simultaneously and then exploded overnight sending residents fleeing as embers rained down and flames raged around them. The flames were fickle in some corners of the city. One hillside home remained unscathed, while a dozen surrounding it were destroyed. The flames were unforgiving throughout the city, torching block after block with little to no salvage. Hundreds of homes in the Fountain Grove area were leveled by flames so hot they melted the glass off of cars and turned aluminum wheels into liquid. One neighborhood of older homes was scorched, leaving only brick chimneys and downed power lines. Residents who gathered at emergency shelters and grocery stores said they were shocked by the speed and ferocity of the flames. Mike Turpin, 38, was at a bar in Glen Allen early Monday when a stranger wearing a smoke mask ran in and yelled that there was a fire. Turpin raced home through the flames in his Ford F-250, quoting Turpin. It was like Armageddon was on. Every branch of every tree was on fire. The Santa Rosa mayor, Chris Corsi, in an interview said this, parts of our city have been devastated, describing the howling winds that drove what had been brush fires into roaring wildfires on Sunday night. Corsi says that when evacuation when orders went out, a lot of people had no time at all. It was grab what you can and run. Authorities have not yet determined the cause of the fires. Although Napa County Fire Chief Barry Bierman, who was early on the scene of the Atlas fire, said that the number of blazes concentrated in the wine country is unusual. The massive Tubbs fire started in Napa County late Sunday before spreading into Sonoma County during the night. Percy described its destructive path. It traveled 16 miles in an instant. It just came roaring over the hills, down through some dry brush. It hit one of our most expensive housing divisions in the hills, went through a commercial area, burned down a couple of hotels, a couple of nice restaurants, hopped over a six-lane freeway, roared through a Kmart shopping center, and then into a middle-class section. It was indiscriminate, and it was very, very fast. So now let's get to some images here. Wow. (laughs) Yeah. That is... Pretty wild. Like apocalyptic, all right. Yeah. Yeah. The whole mountain's on fire. Yeah, again, I would, I mean, we've mentioned this before, but, you know, once you get a fire big enough, I mean, it really takes, it, it's almost like it creates its own micro weather system. You know, there's so much energy there. It can, it, it draws air in, it creates pressure above and a vacuum around it and tornadoes. It's, and, yeah. yeah. It, it, there it's it's incredibly powerful stuff um just large fires yeah and i mean i can understand why people would say it's like you know it looks like the sky is on Look fire at that that's amazing this this is pretty yeah, wild isn't that. it i guess I, i'm assuming that's moving upward rather than downward 
don't know. I don't that know. Is wild. It is <laughs> weird. Now, what's the scale here? What what is the um, what are we looking at? What is the fire? dark? Yeah, really. What is the dark peak? Is that well, a mountain side? I, no, I, or I think that... that's a house. Okay. Oh, I think okay. that's the okay. ridge of a house. I believe. Okay. Yeah, because those flames look look large. I mean, they look um, sort of up close. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Next one, though, we're. Oof. Look, look at how high that is up in the sky there. That burning. That's way up there. Ah. Standing scene yeah, metal roof. Look at the stuff flying up off of it. Yeah. Yeah, right in here. Yes. God, standing, yeah. metal standing roof. seam, metal roof. <laughs> it's on fire. <sighs> mm. Melting it. That the the truck back truck. there. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, you don't want to own that vineyard. Oh, man. Talk about apocalyptic. Yeah. That, my friends, would qualify as a wasteland. It does. Yeah, it, a, a large difference between one day and the next. Yeah. So here again is a is a sort of a microcosmic example of catastrophe. How, in an instant, in this case, a matter of literally a few hours, an entire well, you know, whether it's an ecosystem or a you know a cultural system is just almost entirely erased. Yeah, and the and the you know the ecosystem. I mean, think about all of the animals that. I mean, yeah, the you, billions you know, of insects. Yeah, and all the, the insects, that the bugs, and, and the, or the the birds, yeah, and the yeah. and all the, lizards, and this. everything was feeding on, and all that yeah. stuff just completely wiped out. So you could have, you know, things that survive that you know may not survive the aftermath because they just yeah. don't have the habitat anymore. Right. And we've seen, you know, we've seen, I mean, we've come upon animals damaged in fires. It's not Ugh. a pretty sight, you know, when there's, there's been well, runaway fires out here and you're coming up yep. to an area and then you see like animals coming out of the woods that are mm. just, Terrible. they're blinded and their hair's all gone and just awful. Oh yeah. 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 Well now, why, why are those not all burned black? Well, that's the ash. Yeah, probably it's, like ash, that's that's what what ash saying, piles look It's yeah. just lighter colored. Yeah, it's not charred. It's burned down to ash. Yeah. And then look over here on the left. I mean, you know, imagine Crazy. if you're living in one of these houses like this that's guy a, right here. Yeah, yeah, that's the refugium. No shit. <laughs> okay, what do you, which screen are you seeing? Now we see this. Then there was a coffee, coffee park. park neighborhood before. Okay. Right. Okay. In presentation mode. Okay. Good. So this is the before, yeah. and this is basically a day later. I mean, not that this picture here was taken a day before, but this is what it looked like the day before this. Yeah. And that's crazy. Wow. So, you know, this is the kind of things you have to be factoring in when you're asking the question about, you know, why there may be such a paucity of evidence for, you know, what things were going on culturally or in terms of civilization 10 or 15 or 20,000 years ago. Yeah. Where, yeah. where are the tools yeah. that built those houses? That's what I want to know. <laughs> yeah. There's remains oh, of a like, mobile home. Like a Melted wheels. 
And look at this upside down. Upside That's down. Testimony how the powerful the, there had to have been like cyclonic winds to do this. Gale force winds capable of overturning cars. Or a gas tank eruption. Yeah. Rivers of melted chrome. Wow. That. The ma melted engine. Jeez. Yeah, if you were in that car at that time, uh, there probably wouldn't be much left of you. Nope. Okay. So then this one last interview here, and then we'll wrap it up. This was the interview with Fire Captain John Lord on the origins of the California fires. Question, when you started seeing the devastation and they started showing those ho these homes in complete dustification of all the buildings, what were you thinking as a fireman? The Fire Captain John Lord said, the first thing I that I noticed, I think, was the rapidity of the fire movement, which seemed abnormally fast, considering that there was no weather fronts or winds or anything that I was aware of that would spread the fires that quickly. Also, the number of fires were extremely alarming. Where did all these fires come from? How did they all start at once? And so I started digging. Looking at the destruction, which I had never seen in my career, the totality of the destruction, on the structures, there was absolutely nothing left to the structures except foundation. Now, I've seen that with other fires, but not where it moves like that, not where the fire is moving. And on one side of the street, everything is fine. And on the other side of the street looks like a nuclear war zone. I've never seen anything like that. So would you say that there, oh. So here's Eric Anderson, who managed a narrow escape from his home. Uh, who managed, uh, let's see, where did we go? Okay, from his home on Mark West Springs Road, where the flames swooped down just before 10 p.m. and exploded into the town below. Look what how he describes it. It just came through there like a blowtorch, said Anderson, a contractor. I saw fire trucks racing up Martin West, and then five minutes later, I saw them racing down. I said, time to get out of here. So, yeah, racing up to fight the fire and then going, <laughs> turning around and racing back down. Yeah. Seeing that it was, nope, this is a lost cause, boys. Let's get a hell out of here. Anderson said residents in the wooded area, which is dotted with million dollar homes, had little warning. As he loaded the last box of possessions into his car, a flurry of embers flew overhead, setting off spot fires throughout the hillside community. Um, and then, this is from um, a fire investigator, Carrie Fiesel. I am sorry. I have worked far too many fire restoration jobs and worked far too many house fires to believe that what I am seeing in the news reports, houses just don't burn to ash, not even if you soak them in gasoline. You folks got something else going on out there. And anyone with any knowledge of fires knows a brush fire or a house fire doesn't burn hot enough to melt and bend half-inch steel I-beams. It takes a hell of a lot of heat to turn a whole trailer park to ash and bent beams. Hmm. Hmm. Here we got a breakdown right here of um, the temperatures and the colors associated. Um, the blue flame, as, as it says here, assumes complete combustion. And we're looking at almost 2,000 degrees centigrade. So if we go 1980 degrees centigrade, 1980 degrees, roughly, yeah, almost like 3,500 degrees Fahrenheit. Blue. So if the color is blue, that is an indication of the temperature. Blue. In zero gravity, convection does not carry the hot combustion products away from the fuel source, resulting in a spherical flame front. Wow, oh, that's blue. So that's an indication that it's at least 1,960 to 80 degrees centigrade. Comet Holmes. 
outgassing what appears to be a bluish colored gas. And look at the look at the tail here coming off. Yeah. Hmm. So we've noticed in in these fires then quite a few parallels with the historic fires that we were looking at. Right. Let's think of them. the un, the unprecedented unprecedented rapidity with which the fires came on. Right. That was clearly one of the the the, the similar characteristics. Another one was um, you know the but intensity they all started. Oh. oh well, yeah. Okay. That that there was these all these fires like they named fourteen fires all appeared to start simultaneous. Now that yeah. to me is a very tricky thing to try to explain. Yeah. Right. Yeah, I remember for a while there, for a, a little while there, people were one, wondering if it was on purpose. Like it was so simultaneous and strange that people were wondering if it was deliberate. Right. Right. Yeah. Larson. Well, yeah. I, uh, yeah, you know, I to, to wrap this up, but you know, I uh, actually this was a, some commentary that I did um, regarding that, and uh, this is what I said in the aftermath of the California firestorms. I wrote this right like within a month or two after these firestorms okay. in the aftermath of the California firestorms, quite a number of people on the internet were putting forth the idea that they resulted from the deployment of directed energy weapons without going yeah. into the technical details of D E W. It is perhaps not surprising that many people when confronted with the abnormal nature of these firestorms would try to find a feasible explanation for their extreme intensity, the rapidity of their onset, their simultaneous ignition over broad regions, and the selectivity and capriciousness with which they performed their disastrous handiworks. The parallels between the fires uh, of California with historic firestorms such as Miramichi, Peshtigo, Chicago, and Hinkley conflagrations are obvious and striking. However, I would think most of us would agree that it is not likely that directed energy weapons were the cause of any of those firestorms of 1825, 1871, 1894, or 1910, all of which displayed similar and even greater levels of intensity, rapidity, simultaneity, and selectivity than the California fires. Is it conceivable that in the case of these disastrous firestorms we are seeing at work, a natural process that has heretofore gone wholly unrecognized, a natural process that involves the interaction of terrestrial and extraterrestrial forces. We now know that comet nuclei contain abundant amounts of methane, ethane, and acetylene, all highly flammable gases. Two questions now arise. Is it possible that these compounds could somehow be released from their cometary matrix and be delivered into the Earth's atmosphere? And given that, is it possible that under the right meteorological conditions, these gases could accumulate in the atmosphere to densities sufficient for combustion? So the question, if some process is possible, the system for ecperusis then becomes complete. The solid cometary matter forming the present day draconid meteor stream in the case of the October 7th through 9th fires, behaves like a swarm of cosmic flints, which by generating sparks as they burn up in the atmosphere, ignite flammable gases accumulated in the lower troposphere. Of course, at this idea, this at this stage, this idea is only hypothetical. It would most certainly be controversial. But given the similarities of these events over time and space, and given the known co-occurrence with a powerful meteor stream, in the fires of 1825, 1871, and given the pervasive, extreme, and unusual features of all these great firestorms, and given what is known about the composition of comets, to dismiss the possibility of a comet connection is to be left with a series of coincidences just as or more unlikely. As to the X factor, I would rather not indulge in speculation at this point. But I might venture to say this, the record of myth, legend, and tradition recognizes the reality of great ecperusis events, and from the central position they occupy in both the mythic record and universal apocalyptic prophecy, we can confidently assume that mega firestorms along with mega deluges have left an indelible impression on the human psyche. Also, given the scale and variant nature of catastrophes of all kinds, 
we could also confidently assume that the devastating fires of recent centuries are but diminutive reflections of their ancient counterparts. And given that there is, in fact, a historical reality behind such tales and legends regarding the great destructions, what are we to make of myths of an alternate order of beings? But as if to answer the question for us, there survives a subtle but profound legacy of an archaic world, forms and features that cannot be explained within the framework of conventional models of history and prehistory. So I want to show you something to cap this off, just to drive home the point. And I will, I think I'll go back a few and uh, take a look at something. Um, look at this. All right. There we go. There it is. Fireball <laughs> oh descending gosh. over Napa Valley, approximately 8 p.m., October 8th. And what was the night, the Sunday night, that all these fires broke out in 14 different places simultaneously? October 8th. Oh, my God. Are you serious? Well, there it is. It's right there. And there's, we go back to this. Look at here. From the American Meteorological Society Fireball Reporting Site. Look what I've got highlighted here. Extraordinary meteor activity over California in the hours leading up to the conflagration. Numerous fireball sightings all over California. But no, this idea here that we're proposing, obviously, is completely preposterous, right? It's all just coincidence. That is incredible. There we go. Yep. <laughs> that uh, seems like you got a solid theory there, buddy. Yep. Say so. Comet 17P Holmes, gaseous tail disconnecting from the nucleus. Is it possible that there could be pockets of gas in space? That would be and virtually invisible, right? You virtually know, just, invisible, but. Yeah. Under the right conditions and circumstances, is it possible that such a thing could accumulate in the atmosphere? That's my question. Yeah. yeah or is it completely right. out of the question? It's definitely not completely out of the question, but. Good question. It's a good question. Well, didn't we learn tonight that it's all about asking the right questions? Asking the right questions. That's yeah. right. Yeah. I wonder if the, I have, I, I just have trouble. It's not like I'm an authority on anything when it comes to physics, but it's hard to imagine the gas from space, like, because it's going to be so, you know, it's, it's basically one would think expanding so rapidly. One would think now maybe it expands into the atmosphere. That's part of it. So it's pushing its way down in because of the expansion of the gas. But I, the way I think of it is that these fragments that are coming down, they have those gases solidified inside them perhaps and then they they come down here and well do you recall sublimate. my showing the um the buckyball the methane hydrates yes that's right i would think yes. i would suggest yeah. that that yeah. might be a route to explore as a possible delivery mechanism right delivery, delivery mechanism, mechanism. Yeah. yes that that's what i'm thinking yeah because it's got to but i don't know what do i know well here we go we'll end with this quote a series of fires sparked in the napa valley on october 8th and grew as powerful winds pulled the flames across fields and freeways. The cause of the fires remained under investigation. Flames began to devour swaths of Northern California wine country after most people went to bed on Sunday, October 8th. Wow. Sunday, October 8th, the same day as Peshtigo and the Great Chicago Fire. Wow. Yep. And the, the sightings of the fireballs right on that same. That's, 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 yeah. So I have to wonder too: Is are these are these high winds perhaps a byproduct of these gases being, you know, pushed down into the atmosphere and causing 
yep. some kind of turbulence in the atmosphere. This causes so you've got the ignite, you've got the ignition, you've got the fuel, and then suddenly you have this the bellows, <laughs> the bellows. Yeah, just, it's all part of the same, or the same mechanism. Wow. Now, if you combine something like this on a global scale, or even only a partial global scale, but then also that's associated with we now we know that mega scale distribution of gigantic floods we add to this the floods and the fires and we think about you know plato's writings about there have been many destructions of mankind brought about by many agencies but most of them have been brought about by the agencies of fire and water yeah and i think yeah. what we're trying to show here is that these agencies of destruction have from time to time operated on a scale way beyond anything we've experienced in our historic times and that, in fact, our historic times are what they are simply because we've had an interval without a cosmic destruction long enough for us to recover and build a civilization, a new manifestation, a new incarnation of civilization. But what guarantee is there that the same forces that have been unleashed on this planet many, many times previously won't happen again? And especially right. if we're not paying attention because we're too busy squabbling amongst ourselves about completely made up shit border disputes mainly yeah. yeah so yeah i think there's lessons that need to be gleaned from all of this yeah and then the idea that this that that something like this phenomenon could happen over an ice sheet you mm -hmm. know sufficiently concentrated mass of gases with an igniter and basically the sky on fire over ice then you maybe have, maybe i'm i'm more inclined there's no to fuel there but that's why i would well yeah but it's the gas itself but the problem is well yeah there is little to no fuel and my thought is is that maybe you've got the two working in tandem i mean if we're looking at a multi-impact event because of say mm -hmm. the planet going through the trail of a disintegrating comet we could have simultaneously uh, impacts, we could simultaneously have impact, surface impacts and aerial detonations, along with simultaneously impacts into the ground, into the oceans, into the ice sheets. And so if we're looking at this kind of a multiple impact event, you can see right there, it's going to get extraordinarily complicated to right. try to try to sort everything out. But it can but be you, done. But you throw this aspect of it into the works it's like in you know over a forest and you, you're just burning that up while you're flooding this other place and there's explosions in the sky and it's it well now we yeah, can yeah. i think go back and revisit some of the ancient myths legends and stories uh with a new perspective absolutely that's yep. you know, like one of the things you showed one of the codex pictures had the the dragon spewing water it's yeah like that's right yeah right so it's like there's this is all the hydra it's ancient people have known about this it's like yep yeah fantastic randall well done sir thank you so much yep excellent thank show you. okay thank you thank yep. you i have so we should admit we okay. should mention it we should mention again montana uh and scablands right we've got oh yeah uh, we got the Scablands trips coming up too, so people can sign up for that. Go to contactatthecabin.com and or randallcarlson.com uh, to look for details on both the Montana trip and the Scablands trip. Uh, and also, uh, we will be talking soon about the Another Cumberland tour. So look for more information on that in the future. Brad, of course, will put all the links for this in the show notes. And Kronos had his hat on, so it is the end of the show. Ah, no, what's going on with computer is going crazy um sorry guys sorry it's all okay. good. brad will fix it in post you know um we burned a lot of brush and when you get a big one going it's mm -hmm. quite uh you, you stay away from it for sure <laughs> it's my god look at that and you know the worst thing in the world is high winds yep so when we did a lot of burning, you know, we were, we were watching the weather. We had, uh, we had, we carried radios around constantly on the weather station, just repeating what's going on. Because as soon as you hear, you know, the winds are picking up, you're going to get 20 mile an hour winds. We're like, 
put, put, it, put everything, everything out. out as, yeah, you know, cover it in dirt. Yep. Uh, oh. Stop stop feeding the fires. Um, and yeah, there were a couple times when the when the winds picked up. Yeah, it was uh, sudden. Sudden, and it just, it's terrifying. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, luck, luckily, we didn't have any, we didn't start any forest fires, but. Well, um, yeah, it's a good thing for you guys that it didn't turn into a conflagration like this. Like that. Right, that, yeah. 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 And, but and I you, mean, you, you know, when you're looking at 60 mile an hour winds in some cases, it's just, I can't even mm-hmm. imagine. If you had a big fire and, and then 60 mile an hour oh, yeah. winds. Uh, well, God. you know, I, when we were out on our, our first or second day up in the Hopi lands, when we got in that dust storm, that sandstorm, it was gusting 60 miles an hour, maybe even a little yeah. faster. And yeah, it was almost, it was very hard to stand up. Um, yeah, yeah. Yep. But yeah, I could just imagine with winds moving that faster, faster, what could God almighty. So another little bit of uh wine trivia. There is a there's something called smoke taint in a wine. So some of these California wines that have come out after or during, like if the if the fruit was growing during some of these fires, mm-hmm. when the smoke is rolling through the vineyard, it actually flavors the wine and you can really you get this Really? Yeah, you get this like kind of it's not good. It's a it's that's why they call it a taint. So be careful. Any of you out there doing wine shopping, you know, if you're if you're going to buy a vintage from Napa, Napa, you know, 2018, that kind of stuff, you know, when these fires were going yeah, on, it, t- it just tastes like a campfire. Might get a little smoke taint, mm. or you know, they might treat it with a some kind of fining agent to remove the smoke taint, and so then you're you've got, you know, it's just not as not as clean. Yeah. So. All right. The other thing that happens when you burn, when you have a fire that hot on the ground, um, nothing grows there. I mean, it, it, yeah. you know, there are, there are lots of seeds and stuff in the soil, down inches down into the soil. Anytime you turn up a soil, you'll get uh, the germination of seeds that, you know, that could have been under there for decades. Um, you, yeah. You remember in the Hinkley but, fire, how it, the, the fire just consumed the roots of the trees right down to yes. their... Their yeah. tips and just yeah, yeah, and so these these ground fires that you know they'll they'll heat the soil up so much that it it just burns or chars at least the seeds and the whole uh, the biome that's the in the soil microbiome down there kills all the just bacteria dead. and so yeah. nothing grows in it for, for long years. period of time yeah for many years it's difficult to get them to grow uh, we you know in in our job back when we were doing these burns. Um, one of the things we'd have to do, uh, say months, many months after the burn is go out to where all the piles were and sort of scrape all that ash and try to spread it around and get dirt from the surrounding area and spread it over and around where the fire was so to try to read, you know, mix it with the, cause otherwise you just have big bare circles, bare circles all yeah. over the place where the fires were and nothing will grow there for a long time. Because mm-hmm. the microbiome mm-hmm. and all the seeds have been destroyed by the fire that was on the surface. So, this is very destructive. Very destructive, yes. Okay, so let's... Yeah, but it's, it's like, you know, you think of a forge, right? What is a forge? It's a, it's, a, it's a normal fire, but you got bellows. Well, yes, but still, you can make a forge, you know, you can, as long as you have the bellows, yeah. you can really increase that heat we used to start fires you know to, to get fires going when it was wet um we'd take a, a blower a gas-powered blower and you so you put some fuel on the fire or on the wood and the fuel's burning and you're hitting it with the blower and i mean you just watch it just eat into the trunk you know it's it's fast it yeah it, it's incredibly hot so i that's just my take on it Thank you all, gentlemen. Thanks, Mike. Well timed. Yeah. Good night, gentlemen. Once good again. Night. Good night, Randall. Brad. Good night, Mike. Good night, everybody. Adios, gentlemen.